Okay, welcome back from the reception. Thank you. Welcome back. Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you really enjoyed the sessions uh, this afternoon so far. Really stimulating. My name is Ellen Hughes Cromwick. I'm associate director at the Energy Institute, and we are absolutely delighted this evening to get some perspective on connected and automated vehicle developments. Uh, this afternoon, or this evening, I guess now, it's almost 5.30, uh, we are um, in for a treat. We have here with us uh, Carrie Morton, who is the deputy director of M-City. Uh, talk about somebody who's been kind of through the whole evolution of what is taking place with regard to this exciting new technology suite. Uh, she's going to give us her perspective about some of the trends in CAVs. And then uh, following Carrie's remarks, we're also uh, very delighted to have with us tonight um, Steve Vozar. And Steve is really a co-founder, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a big deal. Um, and he is at May Mobility, which is a startup firm. And uh, Steve, you're going to give us some uh, good hot takes on uh, what's happening in your world. So without further ado, let's uh, please uh, welcome now Carrie uh, to give us her perspective. Carrie? Thanks, Ellen. Uh, I want to thank you for asking me to join you here and for the opportunity to help uh, participate in sponsoring this event. It's uh, been terrific so far. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with Steve, who I knew through earlier seasons of his career when he was a postdoc at April Labs, then moving into May. So he's, um, yeah, uh, ha, ha. Um, So as Ellen mentioned, I'm from M City, and we are a public-private partnership here at the university focused on understanding uh, the pre-competitive challenges around deploying connected and automated vehicles. Uh, so cars that talk to each other and drive themselves. And just a brief comment about what we do at M-City, partnering with over 60 companies from a variety of sectors, um, insurance, telecoms, oh, and a couple of OEMs and tier ones as well. Um, we're exploring, again, a number of pre-competitive questions, but we do it through a framework of deploying the technology. Um, so putting thousands of connected vehicles out on the streets of Ann Arbor, as well as deploying uh, some of our own driverless technology inside our test facility, M-City. Have any of you been to M-City? OK, maybe the better question is who hasn't been to M-City? Um, yeah, you're probably the last people on the planet, so you better get a ticket. Uh, you know, we have lots of uh, visitors come. Uh, and see the work that we do there. But imagine a city that Steve, actually, we first met inside M City, um, testing some of his early uh, work. And imagine a city where um, there is no, um, there's no risk in terms of traffic. Everything in M City is meant to challenge connected and automated vehicles. Once we learn there, we take them out onto the streets. And that uh, actually is a foundation for the second leg of our stool, which is a broad research portfolio to try to understand those pre-competitive questions that remain and then informing um, an outreach and education mission. And education on a broad level, we have um, a, uh, a tremendous voice as the University of Michigan at the federal level. Uh, just yesterday, uh, we were meeting with Undersecretary uh, Khan from the Department of Transportation to talk about some of the many remaining challenges in this space. Um, but suffice it to say, we have a broad uh, experience, but I thought I'd spend just a little bit of time making sure we're all on the same page about what is a connected and automated vehicle, how are these levels likely to roll out, uh, when will we see them, and um, some of the impacts that this technology may have on society. So when we talk about connected vehicles, they communicate, um, we talk specifically about a specific kind of communication in uh, vehicles called dedicated short-range communication. That's 
cars talking to each other 10 times a second so that we don't run into each other. Um, this is, uh, was in the process of a rulemaking at the federal government, but I like to think about it. If an automated vehicle has a variety of sensors, cameras, LIDAR, um, you could think about uh, that being like a human and their five senses. And Steve and his team are working on the brain to resolve all of that so that um, it can drive smartly. Adding connectivity is, is sort of like giving the car ESP or a sixth sense. It can see around blind corners. It can now, instead of just being one smart individual, it can communicate uh, to traffic signals. I like to joke that if we can empty Ann Arbor in an hour after a football game, we've done our job because uh, we have smart infrastructure as well where the traffic signals are actually communicating with the vehicles. In theory, you should never have to wait at a red light uh, at 11 o'clock at night uh, with this kind of technology. Um, but beyond that, we're going to need things like uh, evolving uh, forms of communication like 5G. Um, these vehicles rely on high definition maps. Maps change and they take a lot of data and we need a big pipe to get them into the vehicle. Um, and also to provide uh, convenience features for that value proposition that we were talking about in the earlier panel. You think about these vehicles as being roving real estate pods. How can you bring uh, convenience and features into those vehicles? Um, in terms of the levels of automation, just briefly, a level zero vehicle is your 66 Mustang, I hope, as a car girl at heart and a former engine calibrator that we still see those on the road, at least in some fashion. A level one is uh, including one form, of, um, one form of automation, so adaptive cruise control. Many of you may have that in your vehicles today. Level two coordinates and combines two functions of automation. Uh, it may surprise some of you in this room that a Tesla is actually a level two and under, sorry, I should also mention these are defined by the Society of Automotive Engineers, um, these levels of automation. And it turns out uh, that the human is still responsible for the operation of the vehicle. So at this point, we don't have a lot of questions about the insurance implications, et cetera. It's still a human. It's considered a driving assist feature. But when we start to cross over into level three, and I should say, we see those vehicles already emerging on the road today. Tesla, now GM with Super Cruise, um, and Mercedes developing similar technology as well. But when we start to move into level three, that's where we start adding on a significant amount of technology and complication into the vehicle, and that's why some have skipped over that altogether. So level two, if a level two system has uh, a number of radar and probably um, a camera system, uh, that can actually use machine vision to detect obstacles. Then we move into level three where the human, there's conditional automation, and this is where it gets tricky because we need to make sure that the human re-engages. We start adding uh, potentially LIDAR. Um, we start adding uh, maybe multiple LIDAR, uh, additional um, uh, monitoring of the driver, so technology, um, like the, the one that's uh, deployed in Super Cruise, a company called Seeing Things is actually monitoring your eye tracking. I just experienced it this past weekend. Um, it's a little creepy. Even when you're wearing sunglasses, it knows if you look away from, the, from uh, the front of the vehicle for more than a second and a half that you're no longer monitoring the situation and brings you back in. So these, these are gonna become more prevalent technologies. Uh, where things start to get challenging, even more challenging, is uh, level four, uh, which is what Steve's deploying. We've deployed two uh, driverless shuttles on campus, and this level four technology most certainly um, will require uh, n numerous LIDAR, a variety of types of LIDAR, but um, they're going to be contained to, to um, ver uh, a, a relatively small geographic region. Um, and so there, I think there are some interesting opportunities because we can start to think about how these, uh, these, technolo these vehicles that are level four with uh, increasing levels of technology and capability are going to be able to, um, you know, provide first mile, last mile transportation, but at the same time change the way we move. Um, we can think about uh, the face of a city changing if we don't need parking structures anymore, for example. 
Um, and so those are really exciting opportunities, but they're also really frightening for cities because cities are concerned, what do I do with parking revenue? I, I have uh, a huge budget if I am in the city of Ann Arbor uh, from parking fines. I think probably many of us have contributed to that fund. So what happens when a shared level four is dropping me off and now they've lost that revenue and, and what do they do with that infrastructure and how might it be repurposed in the city of tomorrow? Um, the cost and complexity of those systems, I think, will uh, require them to be part of a fleet operation for the foreseeable future. Uh, probably at least, I would say, I'll ask Steve to venture a better guess, but I would say at least 10 to 20 years um, before they would become something that is privately owned. There's a lot of care and feeding for these vehicles. And then finally we get to level five where we don't need a steering wheel, brake pedals, um, that is, uh, uh, a vehicle that can go anywhere, anytime, and I hope Steve refutes this, but I'm pretty sure I won't see that in my professional lifetime as a personally owned vehicle. Okay, all right. Uh, so, so I think that, you know, part of what I wanted to share with you is a little bit of a reality check for those um, who, uh, you know, are reading in the media that, you know, Cars are going to be driverless everywhere. It's around the corner tomorrow. This is a really hard problem. There are nearly 30,000 or 40,000 annual fatalities in the U.S. every year, but the reverse statistic is that's one per every 100 million miles, and the recent RAND report is telling us that's something like 8.5 billion miles of driving to make sure that these are as safe or safer than a human. And so one of the things that we're working on in M-City in our research and deployment portfolio is trying to understand how do we combine testing on the roads with testing in the facility and simulation to make sure uh, that these vehicles are safe uh, without having to drive the 9 billion miles. And I joke maybe that's why Elon Musk um, sent his Tesla into outer space because he's trying to accumulate miles, but who knows? Um, although last week they announced they're giving up on fully automated, so maybe he's going to bring the bring the Tesla back into into orbit. Um, so, uh, you know, finally, I would say related to that, um, the challenge of proving that these are safe is um, consumer trust. And right now, for the first time, we see consumer trust being rolled back after the fatality in. Uh, Arizona with Uber and um, that's certainly putting pressure on legislators. Uh, Capitol Hill, uh, we have not been able to pass uh, AV legislation um, in the Senate um, because constituents are nervous. This is a reflection of the public and so we have a lot of work to do and we, um, so, so I think this is going to take some time and I would even I would even go so far as to say there is a possibility that with the increasing levels of automation of level two and three automation, which arguably I think even level two can make us safer on the roadways, we just keep pushing the bar higher for how um, well a level four vehicle must perform uh, because we're going to be making uh, drivers safer every day with these lower levels of automation. Uh, Great. So that's Great. That was fantastic. Thank you, Carrie. We may have uh, an opportunity for a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, Steve, you want to take it up? Sure. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ellen, for facilitating and Carrie for the uh, sneak peek at what I was going to say. I do remember uh, meeting Carrie on M City in 2015. Uh, before it even opened, uh, there was a busload of uh, Legislat legislators and uh, I was asked to give a last-minute demo of, of what was going on, and uh, it was fun times. It's good to see it's good to see Carrie up here, and it's good to be uh, doing something very related. So thank you. Uh, so I'm the CTO and co-founder of May Mobility. We're an Ann Arbor-based startup, spun out of the University of Michigan, and our goal really is to change the way people uh, move around the places where they live and work. Um, and we have actually launched the first commercial fleet of self-driving vehicles anywhere in the United States. We are live in downtown Detroit you know, on public roads in mixed traffic. Uh, we are shuttling employees of Quicken Loans from their parking garage to their office. Uh, and that service runs uh, 19 hours a day, five days a week, uh, 52 weeks a year. So we are the only transportation option on that route. Uh, and it's really exciting to be able to get 
these everyday people, they're not first adopters, uh, really depending on the transportation that we provide. Um, we are over 13,000 rides on that route since launching in June of 2018. Uh, and we have some exciting announcements coming up. We are going to launch a new, that's a private route. We're gonna launch a public route in Columbus, Ohio in December of this year. And we're gonna launch, uh, that's as a part of a $40 million uh, federal DOT grant. We have a small piece of that. Uh, and we're gonna move people around sort of near the COSI area in the downtown area of, uh, of, of Columbus, if you're familiar with that area. In March of 2019, we're also slated to, as a public-private partnership, uh, to open up operations in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, that's gonna be an extension of a DART route uh, that's public transportation there in Grand Rapids, and that's gonna be our longest route to date. It's gonna be a 3.1 mile uh, route uh, that will augment public transportation there. So we really are focused on partnering with uh, enterprise and municipal customers to bring self-driving transportation to uh, cities across America. So uh, the question is, how, how did we get there? Uh, well, how are we doing this? Uh, I'll also add that uh, we have a staff of 55 people, uh, much smaller than Waymo. We were founded about a year and a half ago. Uh, in a little, uh, you know, we, we signed docs in January, but we really moved into our offices in April of 2017. Uh, so it took about a year and a half to get to the first commercial route. Um, and uh, we've raised about $11.5 million, uh, which sounds really impressive and we're really proud of that, but it's a fraction of what um, Cruz, Waymo, uh, Argo are spending on self-driving. So how on earth did, did we get here? And uh, there, there are some key observations here. I think Ellen referred to them as hot takes, so we can call these scorching hot takes. Um, about, about what we think about self-driving and, and why what we do is different. Um, so we really believe that tech has not caught up to the ambition of full, anywhere, level five, uh, anytime self-driving cars. Um, the, there's a number of factors here at play. There's not LiDAR that can see 500 meters with the density that's required to drive on the highway anywhere, anytime. Um, compute is not available to process enough camera feeds uh, to, to make the distinctions between a person looking at their phone at 100 meters and a person looking at you uh, at the vehicle from 100 meters. Um, there's algorithmic challenges as well. And there's all sorts of different things that need to come together to make this full anywhere, anytime driving, uh, accessible to, to everyone. Um, however, in the short term, uh, there are plenty of use cases for self-driving vehicles. Uh, you just have to slice it in the right way. Uh, so what we're doing is, is to think really hard about finding a business case that aligns with a need, that aligns with an economically feasible way to get to market. And that's what we found in our self-driving shuttles, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, we also believe uh, I think Carrie will agree with me that customers don't need to, we don't want customers to have to become experts in self-driving technology right. to benefit from it. So we know that uh, there are others in the space, if they have a commercial uh, arm, uh, they, they often rely on their customers to operate the vehicles themselves. If something breaks, they're on the hook to uh, try to replace it, get an exotic part from overseas, and, uh, and, and, and really, people become babysitters of a technology that should be giving them, giving them help, but it's really hindering some, some of their, their workers. Um, and finally, we, we believe that there's value in owning the entire stack of a self-driving car. So we have, uh, in, our, in our world, uh, we do everything from uh, the, the low-level hardware design all the way up through all the algorithms that do mapping and localization and behavior all the way up to the user experience, and we do that for a couple of reasons. One is economic. We don't want to be giving away slices at every, at every level uh, wherein there's no, there's no profit for us. If we give everything away, uh, then there's no room for us to actually make money off of a deployment. And number two is, is a safety case. We need to be able to validate every line of code that's going on on the vehicle to make sure that there are uh, safety checks and balances and every, at every key turn. And so it's very hard to do that when you have a black box system. So we really do not like black boxes that we don't, can't verify what they're doing. So what is it that we do? Uh, and how, how have we put these, these blazing hot takes into action? Um, so we, we try to control everything. We are very, very heavy handed in what it is we're doing. 
Um, so our business model is community scale self-driving shuttles. Uh, we partner with cities and businesses to move people around where they live and work uh, in low speed environments in geofenced areas. So this is gonna be an area of 10 square miles or less, moving people between one to three miles, uh, sort of first mile, last mile, only mile transportation. So the parking shuttle uh, circulator is a great example, moving people from a train station to an office park is another great example. But really we're looking for low speed areas in which we can operate. These vehicles that we use have a top speed of 25 miles an hour and they are street legal on roads up to 35 miles an hour. And there's plenty of use cases in that, in that uh, dom design domain that uh, allow us to find customers that have a need for, for this, this technology. Uh, they seat six people, and uh, it's a really good number in terms of form factor. It's not so few that, uh, that, that you can't move people at volume, but it's not so many that you feel bad if you were the only person on the shuttle. Uh, there are two aspects to our business. One is, yes, the full, the full tech stack. We're, as I mentioned, doing everything, hardware, software. We do vehicle uh, upgrades, design. Uh, we actually partner with Magnet International to do the full production of our vehicles uh, out in their Troy facility. Uh, we basically do everything except for make, hard, uh, make sensors themselves. We partner with uh, the, the Septons and Velodynes of the world, uh, and we don't make the vehicle chassis. We buy a, a, a stock electric vehicle that we then upfit ourselves. But all of the driving behavior is ours, all of the perception is ours, and all the decision making is, is something that, that we take very seriously, and it's ours to, to own. The other thing is that we run the operations ourselves. So everywhere where we are running the vehicles, we have a garage or an operation center where the vehicles charge overnight. We can do data offloads. We can uh, have housing for our staff uh, to keep an office and make sure that the, everything is running smoothly. So we take on all of the pain if the sensors become miscalibrated, if the vehicle's battery is malfunctioning. We take, have technicians on site who do everything from swapping the tires to wiping the seats down at the end of the day. It is truly a turnkey transportation service rather than just selling a vehicle. We actually maintain ownership over the vehicles and it lets us do some interesting things load balancing wise. Uh, so there's three key principles that we've put into play here. Uh, one, is, uh, one is to cheat harder. Uh, so there's no, there's no glory in, uh, in, in doing everything on vehicle or in doing everything quote unquote the right way. So what you'll find from us is to think about everything from a systems perspective. How can we provide transportation to people who need it rather than how can we make a self-driving vehicle? This manifests itself in a few ways. One way is that we actually put infrastructure sensors in the environment that we're operating in uh, that talk to our vehicles and to our base station so that we can figure out exactly what's going on uh, in the world around us. It's like DSRC, and in fact, when DSRC is extant in the environment that we're in, we can talk to that. But we also don't wanna wait for yeah. that technology to penetrate every city. Right. And so we have our own proprietary DSRC-like technology that we can put up in the, in the municipalities, in the environment that we're operating. This is also a great icebreaker for us when we go to a new city. We don't like to do um, what some other providers have done, which is just drop in and say, surprise, we're here, we're operating on your streets. Uh, we like to hold hands with, with uh, regulators and let them know what we're doing. And asking for permission to put our infrastructure in the world is a great way to start that conversation. They start off a little, a little cold and then they understand what we're doing and they start to really get what it is we're, we're working on. The second principle is to know our route. Uh, and so we are starting with fixed route circulators. Uh, so they run the same route over and over again. We're doing it dozens of times a day. Uh, and we've validated every single block of that route multiple times in simulation, uh, manually driving, and finally working up to driving it autonomously. Uh, if something changed on the route, we know immediately. Uh, we've mapped with high definition maps every inch of it. And we know, we even communicate uh, with, with local authorities to know when there's gonna be road closures, when we're gonna have to move around. And so it's a very heavy handed way of doing it, but that's what we feel we need to do to make the safety case that we're ready to run today. And so that is what it is we're doing. When we change the route, we validate, or increase the size of the route, we validate every single thing block by block by block. 
and making sure that we're green lighting it and making sure that everything is, is, is in line before we move on and open up that service to, to the public. And finally, uh, we believe in redundancy. Redundancy in our actuators, redundancy in our sensors, redundancy in the types of sensors we're using. Um, you know, we do not have a religion when it comes to sensing technology. We are using three different kinds of LiDAR. We're using two different manufacturers' radar. We're using cameras. Uh, we are looking at the world from as many points of view as we possibly can. Again, the infrastructure that we're putting in the environment is another layer of redundancy. We want to be able to say without a shadow of a doubt what is happening in the environment in which we're operating in, and that is how we're able to, to get there. So uh, some key takeaways here that I want to, to, to leave you guys with. Um, it's that no single technology is going to save the day. So if someone says, oh boy, solid state LiDAR, that's all we need to get to level five, they're not telling you the truth, uh, or they're a little bit delusional. Uh, if they say, you know, ASIL D rated GPUs are the way to the future, I mean, yes, these are all tools, but there no single thing is gonna be the silver bullet. It takes a systems approach. Uh, and, and that leads into the second takeaway is that not only for the vehicle, but the mobility challenge is a systems-based approach. You need to take into account the business uh, model that you're you're operating under, the technology that you have, and the operational design domain. What we're building today would not work on the highway. Uh, it, it, it's, you're traveling too far, and when we want to get to highway speeds, we will have to do something different. We're trying to constrain it to the uh, to the operational design domain that we know we can operate in today. Uh, and finally, that's that's how we got to market. That's what we were doing. That's why we're in the market today, and that's why we're hiring right now. So if you're interested to uh, potentially come, come work at the a hot startup in the Ann Arbor area, please come find me afterward. Oh, that was great. Thank you both. <laughs> Let's give them a hand, please. And I know, I know we, we've, uh, we've encroached on your reception time, and I'm, I'm sensitive to that, but happy to, um, you know, take a question from the audience. And then as well, um, Carrie and Steve will be here for a little bit during uh, the reception, and please don't hesitate to uh, approach them as well. Want to take a question yeah. here? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, Jonathan Rubin, University of Maine. Um, I've forgotten the gentleman's name. I've forgotten your name. Steve. I Steve, I... Uh, can you, I have two questions, uh, I'd like you to answer both, but you, one would be fine. One is, uh, given the cost of the system, um, what's the relative cost of your transportation versus just hiring a driver to do this route? I mean, I don't, I, I, and secondly is, what are the energy loads of your system compared to a uh, very similar vehicle uh, with, with, with a conventional driver? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I would say that we are very, careful to make sure that we can have a business case that makes sense, not only for us, but for the, our customers. Our customers do have to pay us, and we try to match against what it would cost to have a uh, human-driven system. So I can't get into pricing details, but it is comparable in cost. It's not, uh, we've worked very hard to get the bill of materials down for our vehicles. It's much, much uh, less expensive than a lot of what the research vehicles look like today. And, uh, and so in doing that, we're able to keep the costs down and we're able to uh, run at a price that actually makes a lot of financial sense. Uh, when we work with Bedrock, that had to get, which is our uh, customer in Detroit, that had to get signed off by their CFO. Their CFO doesn't really care uh, if the vehicle is autonomous or not. It has to make financial sense for them. So um, that's, that's how we're able to do that. In terms of energy load, it's, um, it's, a, it's an electric powertrain vehicle. Uh, and it is comparable to uh, a human-driven vehicle. In fact, it's probably a little bit lower because we do have uh, the ability to control the starts and stops, and so it's very smooth. We put a lot of work into uh, the ride quality, and so we're able to, uh, it, 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 we're down a little bit from, you know, if someone has a lead foot. Well, I, I, let me see if I can clarify. I, 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 if you have the exact same vehicle, but not the LiDAR and not self-driving, uh, uh, but with a, uh, a driver in it, What's the load of the, of the sensors and the computer systems to be running this? Oh, uh, yeah, it is dwarfed by the, uh, the power budget to move the vehicle itself. <laughs> like, fair, fair, fair enough, but I, I have seen estimates in the literature that uh, estimate these maybe at the high end of a, um, uh, an air conditioner. So I'm, I guess the question is, is, are you putting an air conditioner load on one of these vehicles? And, and if so, then what's the... 
What's this mean from an energy perspective? What, what's the, sorry? What's this mean from an energy perspective if essentially we're adding an air conditioner in terms of load to every vehicle? So yeah, that's, it's, let, me, let me also clarify here. I mean, there are different ways to go about compute. Um, one is to have a centrally, lo centrally located bank of GPUs that are generating lots and lots of heat. And there are companies that have entire teams dedicated to cooling the trunk of their, of their GPU heavy uh, autonomous vehicle. We don't do that. We're very conscious of our power budget. We distribute power where possible and we are not you know, running with a trunk full of, uh, of GPUs uh, and anywhere. So our power budget is, is uh, we do actually have AC in the vehicle. That's for customer co uh, uh, comfort. Uh, we don't have any auxiliary air conditioning uh, that is purely for, for compute. And so um, really it is, it is minuscule. It, the added load is minuscule compared to the actual energy impact of moving the vehicle and the passengers within. And, and I mean, isn't it true too, this is early days, this is emerging technology and therefore that analysis of what the energy uptake is may not be um, as helpful as we look at the glide path out. If I'm standing up here on number 10 and it's a par five, um, maybe my drive is out 150 yards, but I got a long way to go. And I think that was one of the points that Carrie was raising um, as well. Okay, we'll close it up. One more question and then uh, please enjoy the reception and really excited about tomorrow and having you uh, reconvene here, I think eight o'clock, John, is that right? About eight o'clock and we'll have really good coffee here. <laughs> okay, um, I have very easy, quick question. Uh, do you think that 3D printing technology are going to be applicable or uh, used for the particularly the, you know, like an autonomous shuttle? Like, you I, know. I, I, I would say just briefly that I do think there's going to be a proliferation of different designs. Um, once you uh, don't have to worry about a driver and that particular configuration, I think we're going to see a lot of new uh, specific designs, again, for your roving real estate customized for your use. Sounds like an interesting pod to be in. <laughs> okay, well, we had, um, to use some golf analogies, we've had some eagles today, we've had some great birdies, and also pars. Thanks so much for joining. <laughs> And uh, we'll, we'll see you in the morning. We're going to, I guess, close for today. Again, reception. And I'm really excited about tomorrow. And thank you so much. <laughs>